My name is Kate Armitage. I'm your host for this morning's event and I work uh, as an ambassador for Greenfleet. Um, so it's lovely to meet you. Thank you very much for joining us. Aiming to be net zero by 2030, seven years away, presumably is, is quite a big driver for activities that are taking place. I mean, I've actually just written a paper for it that's currently going to council now um, around the strategy on trying to achieve 2030. Don't get me wrong, I'm always been a sort of a supporter of electric vehicles, but I just said it's not possible at the moment. So that's really interesting uh, because you probably amongst the table, you're one of the organizations who's made more progress in electrification. Um you what you were around now in terms of percentage well, of your fleet? By mid year will be about 30%. Yeah, okay. So because I, and I think um, Patrick, you, you alluded to, you've got your, your easy stuff and then you've got your harder to reach stuff. So kind of working on the assumption that it's the, that 30% is what you deemed easy. My question then is what in your paper, which you may not be able to tell us, but you might be able to illustrate a little bit is, um, what do you think is achievable in the next seven years? You know, well, how are you trying to position yourself well, with this goal? Well, I'll clarify slightly. I don't think it's possible with our current um, plan. It is completely possible to achieve net zero by 2030, but it needs a significant amount of investment to be able to do it. Okay. Um, I've, I've sort of been through the market. I can pretty much replace every single vehicle I've got, even the HGVs with electric. Um, I'm not entirely sure that I'd be concerned, well I'd be a bit more concerned about the reliability of a lot of that, um, certainly on the HTV side. Yeah. Uh, and we were one of the pioneers to trial the Dennis E-Collects, um, which are the RCVs. Um, we probably, I mean it's been a decent vehicle, but it's probably had about 30% downtime, okay. which is, you know, compared to most other um, RCVs, that's a significant due to issues with it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Can I ask what the time frame was? When was this directive first issued? I mean, the 2013 at zero. It was prior to COVID and prior to um, Ukraine and Brexit. And so it's changed a lot. And I have kind of mentioned that in the paper that, you know, do we need to stick to that 2030? Should we be pushing it back or not? Because the whole sort of industry has changed in that time. So when I speak with other water companies, for example, um, we're talking about how are we going to manage? I mean, that's going to fundamentally change how everyone's life is organized, work life. I mean, so you can't unleash a fleet of two and a half thousand vehicles, uh, them being electric and let everyone to pick a time when they want to recharge the vehicle. No, we want to tell them, you go to that charge, you'll stay there for 14 minutes and then you move off. And we need to have the right tools to be able to do that. If we don't, the whole thing is going to fail or we will need to have to increase the size of the fleet to balance out for the, for the downtime. It does sure. raise another question, right? Because you talked about <coughs> unlimited money to throw at your goal and that would make it achievable. Yeah. If everybody in the room had that same luxury, would it be achievable for everyone? Are we constrained in other ways that aren't just funding related or are there other infrastructure barriers or vehicle supply barriers as I'm sure we're all aware of in the room that are, that are blocking us or is it purely a matter of how much money? It seems to me like there's some aspects well, of the, zero yeah. sum game if you're sticking in 160 <clears throat> charges or charging locations across different locations, that's 160 less charges that are either going into the public network or into someone else's depots. There's, there's some aspect where the, the trailblazers are making it harder for everybody else, I think, to a certain extent. I don't know if anybody in the room agrees. If we, if we took this table and put it into a different room in this very stadium today, and our starting point was um, we're not going to prevent global warming if we carry on doing what we're doing, this conversation would play out in a very different way. Uh, and, and somehow we've got to find a way of navigating the practicality with the reality. 
and that was my question to Owen, you know, if money were no object, is it achievable? Uh, and in the context of financial constraints, plus growing, increasing energy costs, which is actually having a detrimental effect on some of these new technologies. I drive a PHEV myself and I work purely in EV, so it's a bit of a, you know, it's not, not very good, but I think they're a bit of a missed opportunity. I think they are, they were or should have been incentivised to the same extent as EVs, provided we could put the right charging infrastructure and the right education in place to make sure people charge them, because it would have been the volume play versus now when getting into an EV is quite an expensive exercise for the average individual that's not getting a company car or a salary sacrifice. It would have seized the market as well. Wouldn't it? Yeah, and, and it would have eased the market along from a home infrastructure, from a destination charging infrastructure, probably rapid and ultra rapid charges, not so much. Mm -hmm. But consider the average driver in the UK does, what, 26 to 28 miles or somewhere in the range of. Most plug-in hybrids today are going to sort you out on pure electric doing that. And then you've, you don't have the EV range anxiety to do the remaining range on fuel. And so it, for me, it's, it's the equivalent of having, you know, if you think back to when we did HD, HD TVs, HD, HD ready TV, you know, this is your EV ready vehicle, get the infrastructure in place the same as you would get the HD TV channels in place. Yeah. And then everybody feels a lot more comfortable when you are making that transition to EV. Today, what you've got is someone coming out of a, an ICE, going straight into an EV, having all of the associated challenges. And we see a lot, you know, we deal with thousands or thousands of, of vehicles and, and EV drivers. And there's a good portion that do go straight back, have it for a month and go straight back, because they can't deal with the behavioural change, which they wouldn't have had if they'd had that e have as, as the interim yeah. step. I've got an i3 with a range extender, and I've been using it for about seven or eight months. We bought 60. I think Hampshire Police bought 40. We bought 60. And they've been very successful. I, I was surprised at how successful they were. Then I was given one to use. And I wasn't best happy because I prefer the Mondeo. Um, it has a limited range. What's the, what's but the... it takes me about, well, I wouldn't even say it was a minute just to take the cable out and call mm. it up and put it in the boot. But I don't want to be hanging about. I think it depends on, uh, on the use probably as well because uh, the taxi company again you know going away from those walls is stepping a few years back alongside the hydrogen uh, Toyota Mirai is the rest of the fleet was plug-in hybrids so we had five series BMWs 530Es and we have the E-Class Mercedes as well and we had the small BMWs uh, the two series plug-in hybrid as well charging it yeah this so we had all together about 200 of these and uh, because the drivers they were doing quite a lot of miles they were moving quite a lot uh, they said look you know I just it, it's they, they could get 20 miles out of the out of the electric battery and they said look you know out of three pin socket it takes me a bit of time to charge it yeah. and I burn it within half an hour what's the point and they get so, benefit of tax still don't yeah, they of course they yeah. have a tax if they took yeah. it so for, for us, that particular use, that, that, that wasn't particularly successful and it was because the people had to move all the time and they didn't yeah. see the benefit because the battery was so small for that purpose. Yeah. yeah. I think it, certainly in the early days when the batteries within plug-in hybrids were pretty small and were only good for sort of, in some cases, yeah. say, some cases even five or ten miles, it was, it, I mean, the early generation of PFs were pretty, pretty poor. And, but you, basically, you, it, you had businesses and fleets just adopting them like rapidly because the tax incentives were were insane. They they were, I mean, it made, it made no sense to not get them. They, the tax incentives were that good, but then there was no extent. There was no incentive after that for them to ever be plugged in. No. So there's loads of stories of the charging cables never being taken out of the out of the case and still wrapped in plastic where the vehicles were yeah. were shuttled on at the end of their, uh, their their cycle. We did that because of the congestion charging exemption, which was uh, which ran for a few years. Um, and that saved us a lot of money because you know everyone was going in and out of the congestion charging zone all the time. So, you know, whereas we would have to pay £12.50 on every vehicle every single day, which would be hugely expensive, we didn't pay anything. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But they, they seem once... li lived or died by those incentives, the same way that EVs are, yeah. are, are thriving on the incentives that are being offered today, the, including the congestion charge. The moment the congestion charge exemption was lifted on the plug-in hybrid, we yeah, changed yeah. everything into <laughs> yeah. ID3 centres. So they, they, they live by those yeah. incentives and they die by yeah, them, yeah. but I still believe they should have those incentives with the right education to ensure that people charge them. 
I was just going to say to Patrick's point on hydrogen, it's one to watch for the future, but even 2030, I mean, at the moment, there isn't really any product, although there's some, there's some in the pipeline. Um, and then, you know, I've heard rumours of um, some of the refuelling stations potentially withdrawing as well. So you're going to have some further issues, I think, with um, refuelling hydrogen, although that feels like for the room here, there's going to be certain use cases would be absolutely perfect for hydrogen. I think there's probably about 12 stations and I've, I've got a O2 app on my phone actually, which shows you where the um, hydrogen stations are. And then when you go onto it, there's probably four or five that show they're available and working. I'm hoping to trial some hydrogen later on in the year from one of the um, van tipper manufacturers. Yeah. Um, and we'd be looking at just having a small tank that's delivered to us rather yeah. than actually an on-site generation. In my previous job before Thames Water, I run a fleet of 60 of these hydrogen Mirais in London. And we were meeting some of your police vehicles there as well. So it was a hunt and cross. It was the filling station, another one was Steddington, which was quite nice as well, run by ITM. We had the first one in 2015 in the company, then further 30 in 2018, further 30 in 2019. Mm -hmm. And the issue really was that the fueling station count didn't really grow during that time so uh, we worked really closely with Toyota with John Hunt from Toyota and when I spoke with John last time before Christmas I think last year he said well you know ITM didn't really help the case because you know Toyota was trying their best to bring the vehicles to make people excited about that yeah. ability and ITM was meant to do their part and start building stations and get the get mm. everything going that didn't happen unfortunately and then they started shutting some stations. And um, the reliability generally was okay, with the exception of uh, the, the compressors sometimes needing a service and sometimes going down. And sometimes they discover a leak and the station would be down for three or four days. I think the, the fascinating thing about the way the government's position on hydrogen has shifted over the last sort of five years in the, I don't know whether anyone is sort of familiar with the net zero review that, that was undertaken by Chris Skidmore, I think it was released about this time last month. Um, through that review, hydrogen is mentioned a lot. It's, I mean, if you if you do the the age old trick of Control F and type hydrogen when you look at the PDF, it's mentioned a few hundred times. Um, but every single time, it's it's in the context of uh, of energy, of energy storage particularly, um, but also energy generation and heating. Um, it is very very rarely mentioned in the context of uh, of transport, which I, I think is really telling, not just of of how the government is now regarding this technology, but I think the, even the, the hydrogen production, I think they see a more lucrative and potentially stable market in developing hydrogen for energy purposes rather than for transport purposes, which in the short term, I think is, is, isn't is particularly helpful to fleets that are looking to, to experiment with, with hydrogen vehicles. But in the sort of medium to long term, if you generate the market for hydrogen through energy generation, storage and heating, then it makes hydrogen cheaper. Then we might start seeing the business case for uh, for hydrogen refueling for for vehicles, uh, really becoming commercially viable. I think until that happens, it's hard to see it being more viable than a battery electric vehicle. Even up to HGV class now, it seems like battery electric is the way that most of the manufacturers are, are looking to go. Not necessarily supply in terms of lead time, uh, specifically for vehicles. Um, but probably more lead time in components for the for if we have an issue for example with our Zeppler if there's an issue with that the components aren't necessarily held in stock and that's yeah. obviously something that we're having to um, cope with if we put that operationally um, yeah it could end up delaying the project a bit and things like that so we're kind of having to try and plan for that as best we can. We had a few cases of vehicles being written off because you couldn't get replacement parts they'd been involved in an accident mm. and judging by the actual like accident damage you wouldn't have thought the vehicles would have been written off but we couldn't get hold of the shell or the right yeah. parts and stuff because of the new product um, you know they wanted those parts for new products rather than spares if you like so it was a real issue we'd had vehicles written off where you wouldn't expect them to be written off uh, on one hand EVs need less servicing and maintenance they do yeah but on the other hand, uh, if that vehicle's been in an accident or has been vandalised or potentially something has broken, I can't think what, um, it might be off the road for a longer period of time. The biggest constraints at the minute are tyres, who are a fixed yeah. brand, okay. EV tyres, particularly Tesla, 
you can be waiting months Recording to, get a, in progress. to get a replacement tyre. I've been to the BBRLA top forum a few times. Everybody's talking about EV tyres all the time. You know, if, if you get a puncture in, in a Tesla or another leading EV where they've got specialist tyres, you can be waiting a really, really long time to get them replaced. And I think it's, there's a difference between the service and the maintenance and the repair. And I think the repairs are much less frequently needed on, on an electric vehicle because there's just purely less that can go wrong. You may need servicing at the same intervals, but the repairs are where you actually see a lot of the safety. It would be interesting to analyse the, the repair costs because, I mean, obviously the components are going to be a lot more expensive than a conventional vehicle. Not particularly. No? No. no. no I mean, I've, I've done some analysis. Um, it's not as much as you'd think. Uh, I mean, it's not as well from what I was told by some of the OEMs saying, oh, yeah, you'll, you'll get huge savings on this. It's not. I mean, the amount of, that we service ours, we, we do them exactly the same. You're, only, you're changing, say, pollen filters. You might be changing two or three filters on a diesel, but you're only talking, you know, 80 quid to 100 pounds per thing. But then, yes, some of the the component, if if it's an electric component, generally those are still similar. It's only the drivetrain. Um, so yeah, if something goes wrong with a drivetrain on a diesel or a petrol, um, then yeah, it will probably cost you a lot more um, because it's less likely to go wrong on an EV. But if it does go on on an EV, it could be a, could be a expensive. Yeah, so one of the things, because through our Epix brand, we look at every leased vehicle in the UK, and obviously there's now quite a significant size of EV volume that makes up part of that. We did a benchmarking exercise last year around what are the EV costs throughout the lifetime of a vehicle, just significantly lower on EV than I saw the way up to about 50, 60,000 miles. Is then that we're starting to see where we've got some older EVs that are making a part of that data set that the costs start to increase. But at least if you're owning a one to three year old EV within the lease space at the minute, you, you're benefiting a lot from reduced SMR. Uh, we've just become a, um, IMI accredited actually. We've got our own training academy because the, it was quite a challenge to get technicians onto courses to get their IMI level three, IMI level four EV training and certificate. So We've actually just opened a training academy within Reva so that we can roll out the training to the rest of our technicians, but also support business as well, because there's going to be the smaller independents that, you know, yeah. like you say, they're going to really struggle to get on these courses. They might not have the investment, so potentially working externally. But the, the good news is that batteries seem to be lasting a lot longer than originally forecast. Yeah. I think yeah. upwards of 100,000 miles in, in a lot of cases, battery health seems to not deteriorate at the rate and, and with the risk that we thought it would do. Yeah. Which means I, I think longer term within the use space, mileage will become a lot less of a denominator of, of quality and of reliability than what we see in the ice space. So you'll be able to pick up an eight year old yeah. EV with a battery that's still in pretty decent shape. We're talking greater than 80% health. Um, and, and that would mean you, know, you could pick up something on 120,000 miles and be pretty confident that you can still run it for another 50 yeah. to 100,000 potentially. My, my concern with the used market is I, I, it really that they've had maybe five or six years to get their heads around this. I still don't think we've cracked how you actually value a used vehicle no. correctly. I think with, it's still, I mean, a, a friend, I hate to do the whole, a friend of mine does this because they're always sort of very anecdotal and not, probably not representative, but um, a, a sort of lo owns a local dealership in Loughborough where I live and he knows what I do for a living and he was asking me about electric vehicles. And in the space of five minutes, uh, I, I basically took a list of EVs that he told me about and, and basically said, yeah, that one's worth nothing. That one uh, is worth far more than you're trying to sell it for. Yeah. And it, he, he was pricing all of those vehicles on the basis of age and mileage. Yeah. And, um, and to me, it, as silly as it sounds, the best way of, of, of understanding the value of electric vehicle is to look at battery. And it, in the absence of having a way of actually interrogating battery health accurately, which I think is a big problem at the moment, in that every manufacturer does it their own way and no used dealership is going to be able to access that, frankly. In the absence of being able to do that, the only advice I, can re I could really give a, a used dealership is plug the vehicle in overnight, uh, get in the car the next morning and see where the, <laughs> see where the, uh, the remaining range has gotten to. And that will give you a, a pretty good idea, as regardless of how far it's driven or how old the vehicle is. I think the battery degradation is an interesting thing that should be more widely discussed, though, because if a resale value of vehicle is going to be determined more by 
how much the battery is degraded than anything else, then surely people should know straight from the start how the battery is doing yeah. and how their driving style is influencing yeah. it. They should be told that. Yeah. So I spoke with some of the some of the potential telematics suppliers, because uh, we're tendering for a telematics supplier specifically for EVs as well. And I asked them this question, I said, can you, if you plug in your device, would you be able to get the information and give us some indication of the battery degradation of the time, put it in a graph so we can see how the vehicles are doing. And if someone is knackering a battery, I would like to swap them yep, out of agreed. that vehicle if they have to behave that way. If, if they don't have to, we would give them a bit of a training and slow it down. Uh, so that we know that um, our fleet is aging or the batteries are aging roughly the same in the same way. And uh, some of them said uh, they could do it. But I spoke with Ford last year in, in their technical center at Danton and uh, they had some technicians sat around the table and uh, they said, well, would you like to see? And I said, well, I would like to see battery degradation. Like I have it in my iPhone. I want to see the percentage. I want to see it on the dashboard. So no, that's not going to happen. I said, I want it. I just think it's, it's another thing that the government really need to take a look at and it's not an issue yet but by the time it becomes an issue it's probably going to be too late to realistically change it for a whole generation of hundreds of thousands of vehicles and introducing some sort of standardization on on the diagnostic systems for batteries in electric vehicles I, I, I think we should be talking about that already and we're not So yeah, I, I think it actually went very well and so once, once the uh, contract was let after the usual procurement and uh, process w w were gone through and I think they got in with a, a supplier I think yeah de delivered as they should I don't think it was too many uh, issues with civil works or whatever I think it was the energy saving trust came and did a survey or mapped the sites along with this is where our property facilities team took over I'm sorry That's okay. and again they looked what, what was viable from a grid capacity so there's some sites, some of our bigger fire stations, one of our bigger fire stations. You can only get one socket on there because that's all of the um, the grid infrastructure would take and the the incoming supply would take. Um, but they've managed to get something on every site in their county and uh, the Isle of Wight was a bit more of a struggle because the general infrastructure over there is, is much weaker. So were you always trying to install as many chargers as the capacity allowed <coughs> into, or how was it decided how many chargers will go to each site? Well, the, um, the mapping exercise, that decreed how many chargers you could get on a site. And then it was the size of it, like if it was a very small long call station in the middle of the new forest, there's hardly any point putting like 10 sockets on there, because that's just saying, well, if there's any really. Yeah need there but if it's a big city centre station and they said you could you could get 10 they, they go for like as many as they can get on there because that's where the pool fleet yeah. vehicles are centred as well yeah so it was a bit of a what can what can we get and then what do we, what are we actually going to need on that side people who people who, is, who sell um workplace charging systems talk about bunk office a lot they do yes right, conversation um but you know what what are you monitoring? What are you interested in? Well, what is it telling you? Well, where is it in, in, in what the what the um what is being charged? I can be particularly with my beloved PHEVs that are coming. It gives, it gives me a bit of a stick to beat people up oh, with. Right, Should we all put up, we'll put bets on. Don't, this? don't. <laughs> this isn't being recorded, is it? Um, <laughs> well. So, so no, so, so yes, it, it will give us an idea. It will give, give us an idea of who is actually plugging in and who isn't, because and uh, for how they long have to duration. Authorise on the charger with a card or something. With so a, a token on the key ring. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so then you have like an RFID tag. There's yeah, an RFID token, yeah. and each token is serial numbered. That serial number yeah. is allocated to a particular vehicle, so we can, yeah, so we can see who's doing what. Um, and obviously, the costs will be interesting. Our, Property and facilities team because at the moment they pay all of the electric bills. Which back office is it that you use? It's the one that come with the provider of the. <laughs> uh, Mer, the MER. Oh, that's right. the weird. Yeah, okay. Mer, yeah. yeah. From kind of inception of the project mm. to that's it, all 60 sites done, how long did that take? 14 months. That's great. Mm. That's yeah, really that's impressive. Really 
London Fan Brigade has 102 stations, mm -hmm. um, and only seven have sufficient power. Sufficient power for anything above the car, basically. Yeah. Um, we're obviously on a project to um, replace our van fleet in the next sort of three years ish. But we are doing a study, our well, property department doing a study on what our requirements are going to be um, for the vans. But further forward for Charlotte's pumping appliances and um, fire engines. I think all of them require upgrade for getting HDVs out there. We only had one, we only had a power enough at one station for one charger for a 150 kilowatt DC charger to be able to charge it. The complication as well is that we're getting rid of all our gas powered um, amenities and going fully electric, which adds to the complication of needing the power source and the that type of thing. Will you need 150 kilowatt? Because a lot of the designs on vehicles. For the trucks we would. Yeah. It's, uh, it's to make sure it's operational yeah. pretty much all the time. If it comes back from incident, you can't have it taken much longer than two hours to charge up. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you everybody for your time today. Uh, Sarah, Matthew, do you have any closing words? No, I just want to thank everyone for kind of being open really. Thank I think you. it was really useful. <laughs> Still learning because um, we've got a lot of commercial fleets. London Ambulance is one of them, as you mentioned, that we're learning from. And I think that's this is the best way to learn. Keep talking about it. Share your problems. Share your your, your um, positives, your wins, and then I think everyone else gets a little bit more comfortable with with moving ahead. So thank you for your honesty. I would all kind of measure the same, which is it's very good for these sessions to have an ear to the ground, understand what's going on within some of you that might be our customers, some of you that are within the fleet space and at different stages within the transition, you're all learning from each other, we're learning from you. And I think it helps us be better partners as we move forward and, and deliver the right things in the EV space the same way we've been doing for fuel now for decades. So yeah, really great to speak to all of you. Feel free to reach out see after the session if there's any questions because we're dealing with thousands of other fleet managers like yourselves that are in the same having the same worries and the same troubles. Mm -hmm.